if you can reach out and remind people that they're not alone, that we're all in this adventure together, mm. and how much fun is it if we can help one another? There you go. It's no more complicated than that. That's the superpower of our species, the ability to cooperate and help one another and enjoy helping one another. It's time to get inside your own head. Begin with the psychology behind your behaviors and fuse it with an acute understanding of self-awareness, emotion, storytelling, body language, and more. Then look at it all through the lens of the latest neuroscience research, broken down to its most digestible form. And you've arrived. Enhanced messaging, deeper connection, heightened influence, and a greater impact on the world. Welcome to the Neuroside of Influence and Leadership with Rene Rodriguez. All right, welcome to the Amplify podcast. And I am so excited because I typically don't have guests on this podcast, but this one I could not resist the opportunity, especially when he said yes. Today's guest is Neil Ford. And I, I wanna tell you how I met Neil. As you know, I love storytelling. I love everything about the science of it. I love the art form of storytelling. I love its business practice. But I especially like it with, with practitioners that have not only been great storytellers, but have used it to drive business results. And Neil, at one point in time, and he's going to refute this because he's too humble to talk about it, but was one of the, the top 10 most decorated creative directors in the entire world. His clients range from brands that we all know. I'll have him talk about some of those things. But you wouldn't guess it from him that he's done these amazing things because he's one of the most down-to-earth, humble people that you'll meet. But I ran across him on, I think it was either TikTok or Instagram. I think it was TikTok. And I couldn't stop watching his, his, his videos. The storytelling was immaculate. It was different. You could tell that he came from the ad design world just based on how the initial pieces came off. It was simple, big font, simple colors, black backdrop, and just so you could focus in on the story. He didn't follow the typical uh, jump cut, you know, start with something quick and run through stuff. He told real stories. And so when I would share them with people, I tell them, I said, look, I go, you're going to have to put your mature hat on in here and not expect something in the first 10 seconds. This is something that's worth waiting for to the end. And what I loved is that Neil stayed true to his form in terms of what he believed in storytelling. And what that translated into now is a following that's continually to grow. But when you hear the stories, you're going to hear a true master. And so I'm going to leave it at that. And, and I just want to first welcome Neil. Thank you so much for being on here today. It's a real, it's such a pleasure to be with you, Renee. I, I enjoy what you do greatly and have a a huge admiration for your skill. Well, I got to tell you, I remember when, you know, the first video that I watched that I loved was your suit doesn't care. <laughs> and I'm going to put a link to this. So you guys got to go watch this video. It doesn't care. <laughs> it really doesn't care. But this is, this is the story that, you know, one, if you're in sales and you're persuasion, or if you're communicating the need for high quality. If your ticket pr price is more expensive than your competitor and you need to explain it, you need to memorize this video. You need to <laughs> memorize this story because it is amazing, but it truly outlines the artistry in quality. And it truly outlines the, the, the artistry in boutique. And you did it in such an engaging story. So I'm not going to give it away, but, but I'm, I'll make sure you follow this and go to the link. But that storytelling piece was was just incredible and i reached out to you and you were gracious and i'm like you know what what if this guy really is open to connecting and you were and it, i swear when we first got on it was like we we're two old friends so it was really fun yeah that is that is pretty cool i think it's uh i think uh, one of the coolest things renee that i've noticed about you and your your clique you know your group of people that you've gathered around you is how sweet natured and generous you all are everybody your whole crew well, it figures that they would be because this is coming from you. And I, and now knowing you, it's also coming from your mother. There's this <clears> kind of <throat> echo of your mother's values, your mother's affection, your mother's ability to draw people. Now, I never met the woman, but I feel like I know her because what I look at surrounding you is this vibe of 
weird humility and generosity. I, look, I'm not going to foam on about it. I just wanted to say it. it's fun to be sort of included in that group because your values and my values emanate from an incredibly similar epicenter. And it's this, look, if you can reach out and remind people that they're not alone, that we're all in this adventure together. Mm. And how much fun is it if we can help one another? There you go. It's no more complicated than that. That's the superpower of our species, the ability to cooperate and help one another and enjoy helping one another. When I observe you and I observe your team and I, and I feel like I'm part of it, it's just so reassuring you know what? I think this is the way to go through mm. this adventure to just mm. try to be helpful. What you just articulated one, first and foremost, the, thank you. The team is incredible and they all really adore are. You. And they oh, all, they all like, you get that. to interview Neil today. I was like, everybody's, <laughs> everyone's jealous today, but you know, what you articulated was interesting and was my mother ever since I was a kid would always have this phrase. She always called herself a community builder. And she said, the book that she's going to write is community is the answer. What's the question? Oh, and, that's good. Yeah. And so as a kid, you hear stuff like that. And, but then you go back and you go, okay, so, okay, what really can't be solved with community? Meaning somebody you, and we, in business, we'll call it, it's about who, you know, it's about your network. It's about all these things. It's the culture community's the, the the godfather the grandfather grandmother of all yeah. of those concepts yeah. and it's not new it's there's something beautiful in the concept of community where people can come together and raise each other and and it's the true essence to me of the abundant mentality which you know god so many people are using abundance and scarcity and and it, it just sometimes misses the point and and you see where people talk about it and then there's a few that live it. And like we were just talking about some of the people that do some of the things that we do. And I was like, I would gladly put people in front of somebody else who does presentation training like you do. And I think you should work with Neil, reach out to him, talk to him. And yes, so do I. And, but guess what? He's going to do it in a very different way that you need in, in that sense. And, but that mentality where people can come together and say, there's more than enough room and space for all of us here. There's so much room for us to play together and if the truest ultimate expression of that is the, the client and the end user gets better, we all win. And the, the, I just love that you see that and do that. So let's, let's dive into this whole thing. And let's just, I, I want to go back to the beginning of mm. storytelling, because we know that stories have been told for 57,000 years plus, <laughs> give or take a few, right? <laughs> right. And Right, pictographs and you know we we're just talking about me being in turkey and you see the the, oh, the yeah. images drawn and but then there's storytelling you know for folklore and oral tradition but then there's storytelling in business so why don't you start anywhere go everywhere when i say storytelling what comes to mind to you all right well let's i want to point out something that you had an insight about minutes ago just seconds ago actually and it's about the idea that community is this is this very central and important and ancient you know, when you use, you, you use the word abundance and then I could hear the ever so slight creeping edge of acid on that. Like, Ugh, <laughs> I, I need to use this word, but it grinds me to use it because you it's got so it. common. <laughs> when in fact, what you were really doing is the, the abundance you're talking about is merely something incredibly old. Have you, you've probably noticed this, Renee, how there's nothing new under the sun. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Nothing. That you can go back in time, pull these things forward, whether it's Cicero or Dostoevsky or Zig Ziglar, right? You know, yeah. you, you go back in time, right? And you pull these things forward and people go, wow, what a great insight. Yeah, because it's the human, it's the human insight. Now, <clears throat> so how does community affect storytelling? And what what is the relevance of that? The the magnificent thing about stories is the ability to reach across the airwaves or the or you know the room and connect with somebody in a very ancient ancient way that resonates with us because somehow it's in our water yeah. it's it's in the vibration of being a human being is to want to share our experience and to appreciate 
uh, you know, consider your mother's experience where she said that she would want to write a book where community is the answer. What was the, what's the question or how does it go, Renee? Community what was is it? the answer. What's the question? Yeah. Okay. So there you go. So that's so profound. That's so profound. When you consider that we're wired, we're wired to need each other. And, yeah. you know, what? how do you drive somebody absolutely out of their mind? Just put them, isolate them for about three days. They yeah. will literally go crazy. Okay. So where does storytelling, what's the connecting tissue? Storytelling is the, it's the art form through which we express to one another that we're all in this together and mm. that we're not alone. And why, why it really pays on an emotional level and a financial level to be a good storyteller is that it's the art form that will help people recognize that you're a human being too, and you have a lot in common. And maybe doing business with one another doesn't have to be strictly economic. Maybe there's some, there's other, some other benefit, some emotional benefit, some reassurance that you can get. I was just talking about my friend, Mike Wethington up in Minneapolis, who has this wonderful company, Outsell. He's a real bro chacho, this guy. He really bro cares. Chacho. He really cares that you win and he's trying to help you. And everybody loves this cat. He's a good businessman, right? So he's no fool. So he doesn't get taken advantage of, but he really wants to help. And I've met other incredibly successful people, Paul Muller out in Philly, who, who has this phrase, I'll lose a little money to make a friend. Mm. And by the way, Paul's a great storyteller too. Mike is too. Now that I think of it, now that you're making me think of it, wow, these people are so successful because they're, they, they communicate with one another, not by telling people what to do, but by resonating with them on a human level where they go, I want to help that guy. If you're listening to this and you're saying, maybe, you know, you're listening to Neil, so maybe there's something that's more beyond the financial. And if you're going, well, it's all business, it's business where it's got to make money. It's not that what he's saying is that it doesn't incorporate money, but every single person that says, oh, you know, it's more than just, you know, relationship or that you said it was that maybe there's some other form of payment. What, what Neil's really saying is that you're helping not only you, but the customer also see that this is more than money, which in essence turns into the money doesn't matter. If it's more expensive, this is a lot more valuable. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Than this dollar that I've been hoarding or looking at or so scared to get rid of because I didn't see something that was of greater value. And so I wanted to also make that connection too that this isn't the anti business thought. It is actually at the core of boutique and highest price thinking. Yeah. There's a phrase that I learned a long time ago in advertising, which was when love is involved, money's no object. Now, actually, it sounds like what you're saying is, well, because I, because I love Coca-Cola as a company, I'm willing to pay more or certainly prefer them on an airplane or whatever. But there's something deeper going on there, which is you were talking about value, 100%, Renee. The value that you're providing is when somebody loves you, it's because you're giving them something either they didn't expect or that they needed more than money. Mm. And you know that like a brand, like a Nike, I don't think people understand how profound, how profound what it is they're doing is from a storytelling uh, standpoint. Well, I'll give you an example. There's this, I met this gal who had for a time been in charge of their women's apparel line at Nike. Super bright, as you can imagine, right? You meet them and you just go, wow, that gal is ferociously smart. Holy yeah. mackerel. She said that when uh, when they were trying to craft how to outreach to their uh, women customers, they made a very big distinction between wearing the things for fitness versus wearing the things for training. Mm -hmm. Okay, and And I thought, oh, 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 talk about that. What does that mean? And so I'm saying this because from a storytelling standpoint, there's a very, very big difference between how you frame something. Now, in the case of most women's apparel, it's going to be, oh, the, you wear this for fitness. But Nike says, no, 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 let's get serious. Let's build to something. Let's help you achieve something. Let's get you ready 
for something that's going to make you proud and that you're going to talk about for years, right? You see how profound the difference is Huge. between fitness and training. And what she said, and this really hit me, she said, I wanted to give them a gift, a gift of an achievement that they earned. And I just went, this is why people love Nike. You know, wow. it's not just the fact that Michael Jordan is you know, that all the athletes sign on and that it's a, it's a brand that contains all of the effort and the and incredible achievements of the athletes. No, no. It's a brand that really is about helping you get something you want, not, not because you bought it, but because you earned it. That's, there's some pretty incredible thinking going on over there. And I really respect that. It's so hard. This is why I respect you guys. Because the, the the things that when you talk to like an entrepreneur, we talk about personal branding and so many people are probably listening, talk and hear people talk about personal branding and they immediately go to color schemes or they go to logos. Huh. And, and it's like when I had to go through it for Amplify and, and what we did, it was, that was six months down the line. There was so much work up front to figure out the ethos and the essence and the messaging and the emotional feel and the the stuff you're talking about here that that is so hard to think about from because you're you're truly thinking from the perspective of the user customer the client and then from the perspective of how they're feeling and then what do they want to feel and what makes them feel the best and then go back nailed and it. go okay so what few words will trigger all of that sequence of events yeah that nails it and like what then my friend drew who you met there talking about the domino statement that one thing if i hit this one domino all these beautiful things start following yeah. but we never so we always see the last domino the logo <laughs> well by the way your logo is really good and uh let's go back if you don't mind my asking you about that okay so for the benefit of your audience the Rene rodriguez logo has this magnificent little design thing which is that if you look at the way it's constructed it says neuro in the middle you can't see it at first, but then it registers. Like, why is the U shaped like it is? Or why, are, why is the uh, the E at the end of Rene and the R, why do they have this dip in the center? Well, so that it'll form a, a U for neuro. Okay. Now, here's what I want to find out from you. To what extent did you give the designer freedom versus direction? 100% freedom. I, didn't, oh. I had no idea that existed. Okay. And so that was the, so that was the work that the, my good friend, Matt Walsh, who worked at Crispin Porter Bogusky, he was their head. Oh, of yeah. UX. yeah. <clears throat> Very respected. Yeah, he's a hitter. He, he's, um, he, he, one of my best friends in the world. And he now owns a company called the Greenstone and they do this for all the big brands. It's amazing. But I called him, I said, Hey, can you help me with my brand? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> $300,000 budget for family pricing. I'm like, no, dude, I go, I'm just a, <laughs> I don't got that. <laughs> He's like, well, I'll quarterback it for you. You know, we'll, we'll let you use some of my people. And he was very gracious. And, but I go, okay, so designers, what do you want? He goes, designers. He goes, we don't even know who you are. Yeah, there you go. Right. There you go. And I was right. like, what do you mean? He goes, well, we need to get a copywriter. I'm like, I go, I'll do the copywriting. I wrote, I can write. He goes, no, you don't understand copywriting. I'm like, yeah, I do. He goes, no, you don't. I'm like, well, what don't I understand? He goes, well, what's your ethos? I'm like, my what? I go, I know what I mean by ethos, like credibility. He goes, no, no, no. Like, what's the, what's your essence? And and I had no idea what that meant. And I still struggle with that, even though I teach it. And so I tell people is be very careful when you think you understand that. But he made me get a copywriter, Josh Blatterman, who's incredible. He gets me on there for three hours. He's got this Afro and he's just like, Hey, what's up, man? I'm like, okay, what's this guy going to do? He goes, so tell me about you. And so I just put my head down and I talked about me for three hours, hour and a half in, I bring my head up. I'm like, are you uh, taking notes? He goes, it's all good, man. Just keep going. <laughs> and I'm no idea where I'm going with this, but I started talking about like the things that were most important to me. Like, you know, neuroscience was critical and the science and the, I called it the behavior, you know, the, the brain research. And I said that, you know, I want to make sure that we create lasting change that, you know, that it's, it's more than just a workshop. It's not rah, rah. I don't really care about applause, you know, all these things. And at the end I'm going, okay, what's he going to do with it? He goes, all right, give me a few days. I'm going to go paint something. 
and come back. I'm like, paint something? He goes, yeah, I do my best thinking that way. Hmm. Okay. Goes back like three or four days later, and he's got this 10-page document called an ethos exploration. And the first thing it said was that I'm a neuro innovator. I'm like, neuro innovator? He goes, yeah, you innovate on neuro neuroscience. I'm like, wow. Okay, that's interesting. I'm like, I, I can't imagine. It's accurate. It's also accurate, which is nice. But it's yeah. we, we go, but I go, I can't say that to people. I'm like, hey, I'm a neuro innovator. He goes, no, it's not meant for you. And I'm like, well, what's it meant for? I'm just so confused, right? And then finally, the, then these phrases came out, like Renee's impact doesn't leave the building when he does. I was like, that's yeah, what that's I've been funny. trying to say. Okay, now I get it. And he goes, fluff isn't enough. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, and then he goes, you know, his success metric isn't applause, it's results. And then all these great things. And then out of it was this focus on neuroscience. I go, so what do I do with this document? He goes, give it to your designer. So I give it to George. And he goes, give me a few weeks. I'm like, dude, I need it in like two days. He goes, Renee, give me a few weeks. He took two months. And he started by drawing brain waves and all this stuff. And he knew that I was a fan of Gestalt psychology, which was negative space, like the, the FedEx logo, because I use it all yeah. the time. And yeah. the dog and perceptual illusions that you can't see. And once you see him, it's there. And so then he came back and he presented to me. And there, lo and behold, the thing that I love the most, my ethos, is in my darn name. The last two digits of, or last two letters of Renee is N-E. And then there's a space and then R-O. So he just created a little U kind of hidden little you there and Nero came to life. Now there's, there's something else about the logo that you, I don't know how conscious you are of it, but it isn't just that, that makes it special. There is a crispness and a cleanliness and an orderliness mm -hmm. and a certain weight to it. Uh, you know, as a student of this, I'm looking at that and I'm going, Oh, he's really got it. <laughs> just consider Consider the uh, the orderliness of your own organization, of the, mm -hmm. who is in the organization, and how how that conforms. How the logo actually is remarkably consistent with the lack of chaos. Right, this is not a hand drawn logo like you'll see a signature or a roughly hewn logo to, to indicate, like like a barbecue joint. Would it would look like it was just uh, printed from an old you know, press. No, no, this is very orderly, very crisp, clean, incredibly well-weighted. In other words, it isn't just the word neuro, it's that all of the surrounding livery mm. also communicates a level of professionalism and care that you're getting. You, people take this all in subconsciously, but when you really examine it, you go, yeah, so two things happened that I think are worth pointing out. Entirely aside from the fact that you gave them license, you know, you didn't tell them, yeah, I know you said a month, but I need it now, right? You, you, you can't do that. You've got to let yeah. people do what they do. Otherwise, you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. You know, it's, yeah. this, it's, it's the inclination of somebody who's very successful in business getting on the airplane and telling the pilot how to fly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you've seen this. I know you've seen this. The six hour flight, make it in two. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so work. there's something just gorgeous about watching the results of people who let professionals do their thing and then sit back and go, oh yeah, that's nice. People take in these things subconsciously. They're, they're really not aware of the little things, but they, they nevertheless absorb that there was a level of professionalism going on there. Like, I just posted a video this morning. I don't think people are conscious of why the color choices are what they are, or why would you have an alter in a little quote at the end, the the punctuation has two different colors that mm. go in reverse of the text. Why would you do that? Well, I do these for very important reasons that I know that you're not <clears throat> going to appreciate. But in the in the words of the monks that used to build, they they there was this monastery in France where they used to make furniture, and they were world famous in their day for this gorgeous furniture. Sometimes when they would take this furniture and they would carve it, they would carve every surface area of it, even when they would back it up against a wall. So it was like an armoire that would sit against the wall, and people would say, "Why would you carve?" the part that's never going to be visible. And the, the comeback was because God will see. Mm. And, and so a craftsman like your logo maker 
even if he isn't necessarily explaining to you every detail of it, he knows. He knows. And that's enough. He can't he do it. Knows. His pride, his pride won't let him do anything less than that. So the the one direction I did give was because what we do is considered heartfelt, emotional sometimes. I go, I can't be too soft because the work already is quote unquote soft enough, right? It had to carry a, a business professionalism. Yeah. Like you well, said, it does weight. that. It does that. Definitely. That's really awesome. I think, see, like if you're listening to this and I want you to notice how a couple of things. So Neil brought something up and he, instead of explaining it, he told you a story. He did it right there. He's doing it all the time and it's beautiful. And he just has these stories at, at his becking call. Like, I love how you just, you said, well, instead of me telling you there's certain thing you I mean, he could have just said, you know, there's certain things you just do because you do them because you got to take pride in your work or you do them because, you know, they'll, they'll, you never know when someone's gonna look at the back. Instead, he tells you a story about a monastery and monks <laughs> and because God is watching. And then it's like, I want to live into that level of integrity. Like I want to do stuff because God is watching. Like that's like a whole, talk about a level of accountability, like yeah, there you the go. truest essence of character in that sense. And I mean, what a cool, sometimes, and it's like, what do you go? It says, you know what, I, I may not be able to explain it, but I explain it this way. You may never see it, they may never see it, but I know God sees it, and I know it's the right thing. It's like, whoa, okay, that's just a powerful way. So just listen to Neil as you're doing this, because <laughs> he's just, it is who he is. And this is yes. one thing I try to explain <laughs> to people, is at first you may try you might have to try to learn storytelling and try to practice it and force yourself to remember to tell stories but at, when you finally get it you realize it's the easiest thing to do and it's the most efficient and it's also the most pleasant for everyone and then on top of it, it just happens to be enjoyable as long as there's a lesson at the end and like I, I, it just it just becomes who you are with more practice i love that and so you said a couple of things too one, we're not in this alone. We want to share our experiences. And the fact that there's no new fundamentals. I think Zig Ziglar said, be wary about the person who says, I got a new fundamental for you. Yeah, It's like yeah. the person who manufactures antiques. It just, that doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> they'll lie to you about other things too. These things have been around. And so, but the, the piece that we're not in it alone, I think that's a really powerful element of being able to say, like you go back to Simon Sinek and he said that, you know, the loyalty is created when you start with why, because we're in this together yeah. versus you're selling me something. But the other thing I want people to understand too, is what do we mean by storytelling? A lot of people think it's a once upon a time. Storytelling is about a beginning, middle and an end to something. And the new research, I don't know if you saw, you heard this, but I have a, a colleague, a partner of ours that franchised this work in, in uh, Europe lives in Italy. You'd love Dr. Al. In fact, I'm going to connect you and Dr. Al Ringlip. He was a co-founder of the Neuro Leadership Institute. And the thing that he talked is we, we talk about, you know, the ages of nine to 13 being a critical time period for understanding the origin of who we are and our values being mm -hmm. formed. And he said, Renee, that is so accurate right now. And he goes, it's even better between the ages of three and four is when the human and a child realizes that life has a narrative. And he said, and I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, it has a beginning, a middle and an end. And he goes, okay, what does that mean? And he goes, well, a son or daughter sees their father. Dad is thirsty. Beginning of the story. He walks over to a Brit, to a fridge in the middle of the story. He drinks something. Huh? He's not thirsty anymore. And there's a narrative to that. There's a beginning. Thirsty, go to fridge, drink. Oh, it's over. There's a little mini narrative. And so the beginning, the narrative of how the logo came to life that we just talked about. So how you and I met, that is a story. There's a narrative to that. The, the essence and the, the, the genesis of your product and service, of why you believe in, 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 in service in the beginning, why you believe in the, the word concierge versus customer service. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a narrative to all of it. And you, you even said one which was so powerful of being fit versus getting ready for something. Like that's a narrative shift. And that narrative shift is a construct of how we understand our reality. And so this, when, when Neil's talking about storytelling and narrative, we're really talking about the application of anytime there's a beginning, middle, and an end. There's a narrative beginning, middle, and end to a relationship, to a transaction. What's the story of that? And how does that transpire? So by the way, I, I just I have to, love that. I have to tell you, you were talking about like that a three or four year old watches their father go to the refrigerator, get some water. 
here's one for you. This really happened. When my daughter was about four, she sits down on the couch next to me. We're watching TV together. And then she says, you know, dad, it's okay if you have a beer. And I thought, oh, okay. And she says, as long as you're up, can you get me a juice? Wow. <laughs> wow. Now, oh, art so, of persuasion. Uh, so I'm, you know, it, it, it's one of your moments as a father where you're simultaneously proud and terrified. Yes. Because you're going, how old are you? She, uh, I overheard her when she was about five, say to a nine-year-old, you can be my assistant. And again, that's when you just go, well, my retirement's taken care of. I yes. love that. You know, fun. isn't it funny? I was talking to somebody, it's like, you know, the, the, the beauty in that in you know kids where you know and this is a the age old you know a, a boy for being assertive would call him a leader but a girl doing that might call her bossy or she's just leading you know there's a there's a narrative to all of that and you know parents are setting the narrative for their kids mm. all the time yeah you know great. and it's it's the the frames and the words that we choose to label behavior becomes part of the narrative story that they tell themselves in my case, I observed, you know, when my little girl was very young, four, five, six, seven, uh, she was just absolutely this, you know, this live wire filled with rambunctious, you know, silliness. She just loved to be silly and dance around all the time. And then what happens to them, and this happens, I think, maybe more now than it used to because of social media, the, the sort of the <laughs> light goes out between, say, nine and 18. Like they become this incredibly reticent, suspicious, um, you know, they, they, they're they hiding their light under a bushel. Thankfully, Tony sort of reemerged. And she's now back to who she was, all, albeit though she's like, you know, cleverer and better educated. But I'm starting to see that rambunctious spirit em emerge again. But when you Let's go back to, okay, well, why would the light go out? Why? What's happened to them? I'm not so sure that it happens with boys, but I know it happens with girls because I've seen it in a couple of, not only Tony, but her friends. I think what happens is the, the consequences of doing anything with abandon gets picked at on yep. social media. As soon as you raise your head up, somebody's there to cut it off. <laughs> and it's... This, I believe, is the real problem. Uh, I believe that parents need to be there. What made me think of it is your characterization that a parent shapes a narrative <clears throat> that their child is going to live in. Like, we approve of this. People yeah. like us do things like this, as, as Seth Godin would say. And my guess is this, that in your own life, in your own case with your family, because you are, are so tuned in to narrative and how we're living you know in other words the story we tell ourselves about ourselves is so important you're going to be there to shape how your children see themselves and had i to do it over again i really would have sat her down and said don't let anybody yeah. put put that light out you know i'm noticing this is that true? Tell, talk to me about this. Yeah. Fortunately for her, she got, you know how your, your life can be ruined by getting in with a bad circle of friends. Well, she had the opposite thing happen, which is she's, she's got these very smart, energetic, kind, warm, supportive friends. Love that. For a, for a young girl, that's a gift you can't put a number on. Yeah. I know. I, I, I wish I did a better job. I've, I've gone, you know, this is the, what I tell people is the things that I know the most about are the things that I probably need also the most help with, you know, just because you understand, I think it was Stanley Kubrick said, the ability to eloquently talk about a subject matter can create the consoling illusion that we've mastered it. And like, I, I try to tell people, so the, these things that I'm talking about, I also need them just as bad. I, I can talk about communication, but I need to be held accountable. Like the narrative is so unconscious that, you know, you can, I can, I can pinpoint it with my clients and anybody around, but then I can, forget, I can just totally botch it with my kids. And 
you know, the more of, as I reflect, I've kind of come back and say, let's revisit some of the things that I said to you. And mm-hmm. I, and the, the narrative that I put around it was your job, you're already going to be too much like me. I go, I want to <laughs> change. I want you to fight against being like me. And, and I go, and that's okay. And you're going to, you know, do the things that I did well, take them and run with them. But you got to figure out all the stuff that I did really bad. And I go, and I, I will, it is going to be a success if you can be not like me in those areas. And so almost like open the door to be like, oh, so I can disagree. I can go a different route. And, you know, just trying to have to reframe some of the things that I did in the past. And I was going to write this article and said, motivational speakers killed parenting. <laughs> so that's a, I must tell you, that's a pretty good hook. Okay, dig dig in. So right, yeah, and it was this this thing, you know, because I I grew up without a motivational parent, and I think most of us did didn't. Then then we started listening to motivational CDs, and then we started Mm -hmm. then going back, and so maybe we need to play that role for our kids, and it just it got them past like. I don't know. It just pushes this un this weird pressure to pretend to be okay or to pretend to be overly positive, and we lose sight of some of the ups and downs that it's okay to feel. Uh, I, I have a question is, for you, Renee. Uh, help me with this, because I I can't make up my mind about this. Okay, you're a father, so what happens is you've got this image in your head about what a father's supposed to be. And then you have your own internal winds and your own instincts about how to behave. And sometimes they don't agree. So in this case, like, you know, there are there for the last couple of years, I went through a transition, a pretty big one. You know, one minute you're doing this and you consider yourself successful, but you got this sneaking suspicion that maybe I'm not as successful as I could be if I tried something else. But you also know that's going to be jumping into a cold swimming pool and there's going to be a period of, you know, it's going to be pretty hard scrabble and you're going to have to make some sacrifices. When you're in that valley, you, you're thinking to yourself, well, I can't admit to my family a feeling of vulnerability or like, I don't know if this is going to work. And because, because you feel like, well, I'm supposed to be the strong one. So I don't want to admit to this because I don't want to panic anybody. But at the same time, you're also thinking, well, for my children, I want to model what this experience is like so that they'll know that in their own lives, if they go through a rough patch, it's okay to admit it's a rough patch. It's okay to say that. So you understand what I'm saying, this dilemma. How do you, what do you do? What's your view on that? So I think what I'm hearing you say is when you are the leader, quote unquote, and you're scared. Yeah. Can you say it? Hundred percent. That's it. it. That was very well put because that was it in a <laughs> nutshell. It, well, I think it's a real challenge, and I think well, I think there's a couple answers to that. I would say there's a few answers. That's the beauty of CEO forums and and CEO roundtables is that they can be scared uh, with each other. Yeah. And other CEOs who understand that who can't go back to their organization and go, I'm scared to death. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's certain things that you know scare me to death, but I'm not going to go tell my wife about them right now. Yeah. She's looking to me to say, are we okay? Yeah. And there is a sense of burden that comes with that leadership, which is why not everyone is a leader in, or chooses to lead, excuse me. Everyone can yeah. be. Why not everybody wants that heavy burden of responsibility. But I think that there's ways to be transparent in that and to say, like, because you can, lead, can you be scared and lead? Yes, I think so. Somebody taught me this concept. I don't remember what it was. I don't know, or came up with it somehow. It's the sequence of empathy, transparency, and authority, where a, somebody is scared to death about something, or let's say I got to communicate something really difficult. You know, so you know, start with empathy. Look, I understand that what we're going through right now is really tough, and it's 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 scary. And transparency. And I, I also I've let a lot of the news kind of get to me sometimes. And I, I began to doubt and question, are we doing the right thing? There's your transparency authority, but it, here's the authority, but here's what I know for sure. Whether or not I feel that way or not, we still have to serve customers. We still have to get up every day and show up and give the best quality service that we can. And we still got to close deals. And so, you know, so there's this beautiful 
way of doing that and still leading at the same time. And with my kids, what I try to do is saying, look, I go, I want you to notice. Like I remember one time we had a downsize twice and I told them, I said, we're going to get to a smaller place. And I said, this is going to be for a few years and you're going to learn that this is not easy, but it's okay. And the reason is sometimes you have to sacrifice something maybe for a couple of years to have the home that we want mm. and which will be bigger. And I said, and the cool part is, is two years will go by just like this. Mm. And I remember having that conversation with both of them. And then when we moved into, you know, one of the, you know, like sort of the, the home that like was unheard of at the time. And, and I said, do you remember when? And they both said, yeah. I said, was it worth it back then to have this now? And they said, absolutely. The, the lesson that I'm taking from that is this is a multi-generational learning. That is, they're going to carry that lesson. They learned it early. They saw it. They experienced it. They absorbed it so that they'll always understand it and feel it. They'll know that sacrifice now can lead to great things later. And as they act on that, and they experience that, they're going to carry that to the next generation and so on. What I'm taking from what you're saying, and this is why I asked, is this very useful way of framing this to say, the, the fear is not relevant. What's relevant is the willingness to sacrifice something in service of a greater outcome. Mm, I love that. Now that that's <clears throat> what a leader is willing to do and share is to say, I'm not pretending like this is all sweetness and light. I'm simply telling you that the sacrifice is going to render a great result. And I would uh, think, that to me. I love how you said that, that. I would say three things. Fear is irrelevant. Sacrifice is irrelevant. And hard work is irrelevant. Because either direction, you're going to have all three. doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Good point. Right. It's going to happen because anyway. You, yeah, Might as well control it. If you don't do this, it. you're going to have to sacrifice what you could have had. Yeah. If you don't do this, you're going to be scared because you may not have enough money. If And if you don't do this, you're going to have to work harder because you make less. So yeah. fear, sacrifice, and hard work are unavoidable. But I think it's also, too, that that lesson has to be told so many times over and over and over again around that. I mean, so many times over and over again. I think the the you'd asked a question around do they lose their light? And have you heard the story of why zebras lose their stripes or why zebras have stripes? Well, I've heard that they, it's because the flies can't land on them or something. Scientists were trying to figure this out. And that was one of the theories was, okay, why do zebras have stripes? So the first one was, well, maybe it's for camouflage. Well, no, they can't. You can see a zebra three miles away. And so then they said, okay, that's not it. Well, maybe it's for flies. And so they tested that and they did that. No, it had no impact. And then they thought maybe it was for heat because of the, the sun. Mm -hmm. No, no, that didn't do anything. And then they realized, they said, okay, well, we're going to go mark one of these zebras. And because we want to watch its behavior. So they run down, they take the Jeep and they get a big paint bucket and red paint. And they go down and they put a big red X on one of the zebras. And so they could watch the zebra. And as they're watching, within just a couple of minutes, a lion goes and eats the zebra just instantly. And what they discovered was that the wow. zebra stripes aren't about camouflaging against the lion, it's camouflaging in themselves. And so wow. they, they hid within themselves. And so a lion would, would get a bead on one of the zebras. And then all of a sudden they're about to attack, but then which one? Oh, I lost it. Okay. Hold on a yeah. second. They go back I find another Brilliant. one. Okay, I got this one. All of a sudden that's lost. And then go back and then that's lost. And they go back. And the moment the one was there, they, they could hold on to it. And so the lesson, I mean, there's so many lessons in there. <laughs> yeah. but the big lesson was that there's massive risk in sticking out. Yeah. There's massive yeah. risk in being the one. So that yeah, they out. lose the light. It's a survival technique. It's an adaptation to, yes. the, to the threats. To the threats. And so then I say, the lesson isn't about trying to get them to, to be different. The lessons are, how do you prepare yourself for the realities and the threats of life? And if I can cope with that in that moment, and I'm given the coping methods to go, I'm going to be ridiculed. Okay, so what? Yeah. I'm going to be made fun of. Bring it. I'm going yeah. to be. I'm going to be alone. I've not my first time. 
you know, there's, if I can prepare them for those realities, then the end result will be, I'll be much more inclined to be myself. Well, that's good stuff. Yeah. So anyways, like from storytelling to this, <laughs> well, couldn't we all, I mean, shit. To, I, I, storytelling I like about it. fatherhood. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a magnificent observation, though. And, and uh, now to go back to what you had done earlier, I want to point out for your audience, the way that Rene had made that point was by telling the story about the survival uh, of the, the zoologist with the with the zebra. It's a wonderful example of a metaphor that adds color, texture, and depth to a point that would have otherwise just been a bullet point on a slide. Mm. That this bullet is points. right. <laughs> Let's do this for the benefit of your audience as well. When they heard you describe the zebra and then the, these people go out and they paint a big red X on the zebra, everybody could see that in their minds. Yes. They all had that visual in their minds. Well, how big was the X and how thick was the line and what was it, paint? We are exquisitely good as a species at imagining what that must have looked like. Yeah. This, again, is a superpower of the human species, the homo erectus or whatever we are sapiens is that we have the ability to port picture fiction in our heads and make it real. And to that extent, then you just because you have told somebody a point doesn't mean they've absorbed it. You have not exonerated yourself simply by telling them a fact. If you really care about whether or not somebody got a piece of information, absorbed it and can use it, you must paint them a picture. And so that uh, from Ron, Renee's years of doing this expertly, he brings up the point of the, of the zebra as a way of saying, look, there's a reason why the light goes out. And it's not because they've been destroyed. They're just adapting to the environment around them. Therefore, you can both have a survival mentality and be prepared for when the lion comes after you. You know, it's really cool that you just, so what that you're pointing out there is the key to creativity in an organization is not to try to get people to be more creative. It's a creating a safe environment. Yeah, there you go. Wow. And it's wow, the, that's true. it's, it's that we we have a, another course we call engage and it's focused solely on environment, not on an individual. And we know that the individual wants to be creative, wants to be innovative, wants to be generous, wants to communicate, wants community, wants all the things that people want. I said, well, stop focusing on the individual and create the environment for that. So what does that mean? Like the, you know, we give an example of my kid who wanted a fish and we got them the clown fish, which is a saltwater fish and he'd feed it every day. And then all of a sudden you'd, you'd see in Nemo, they named it, would come right. to the surface and he would eat and it was beautiful and but after about three months, that water got dirty and Nemo wasn't running to the surface anymore. He was kind of sluggish on the bottom. And my son's like, well, maybe we need a new fish. And I'm like, okay. So. <laughs> yeah. I know a lot of employers that have that mindset. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I mean, how right. perfect is that about how well, right. maybe we have the wrong people? And I said, well, you think we put a, a new fish in there with an MBA and uh, it'll swim okay? And he looks at me and he's like, well, maybe we should clean the water. I'm like, well, what a brilliant idea. And of course, we clean the water and Nemo starts swimming again. And by nature, we're designed to do that. And so what's the environment? It's, I think it's one thing, one thing and one thing only, psychological safety. Can I bring an idea and speak the difficult truth without repercussion? Yeah. If that's there, everything else follows. I love that. And you, you had said, uh, I mean, you, you've heard the concept of death by bullet, but get death by PowerPoint. Sure. But I think based on what you said, I might call that death by bullet point because PowerPoint can be used elegantly if done correctly, but it's the bullet, one bullet point. I, he, he killed us one bullet point at a time. <laughs> Just brutal. Yeah. There's, uh, I, I do want to reinforce that when it comes to storytelling, it's the advantage of telling a story in any kind of business context, a presentation or what have you, is that it is vastly more likely that the person listening will absorb it and remember it later. Because stories like, like song lyrics are easier to remember than facts and data. Yes. It's just the way the species is built. You know, hundreds of thousands of years of telling stories around the fire about how we're going to hunt the bison tomorrow. And, uh, you know, what it has done is it has primed us for, 
for memory. That's how you remember things. And you are not, again, you are not exonerated or you are not relieved of your responsibility to impart something to someone else just because you've told them. The only way to be sure that they've got it is to, it. they have a term for it. It's called convergent validity. The convergent mm -hmm. validity is when you're coming, you say the same thing from three different angles. Here's the fact. Here's the story that illustrates it. Let me now show you a picture of it. Because it comes in through different parts of the brain, mm. they converge on making it true in your mind. And this is it's why, amazing. yeah, in advertising, the way that they'll do is they'll say, first, I'm going to show you a television commercial. Then you're going to be reminded of it on the radio. And then I'm going to show you an outdoor board. Now, oh. it's not just that I'm reaching different people. It's that anybody that saw all three assumes it's true because they've been given sufficient evidence in in their environment that this is seems that, to be a repeating pattern. Is that like the six times six different ways concept? I suppose it is. It certainly yeah. sounds like it is. And what's interesting, this fits statistics too, when you talk about content validity and face validity. And when you're doing a test or a survey, is it content valid meaning is in uh, is it does it pass a validity test? I mean, will it be a, a significant significant test if it's asking the same question in multiple ways? Mm -hmm. And face validity does do it, you take it no matter what I'm feeling, I get the same answer each time. It doesn't change. So convergent validity, it's I'm I'm getting the same I'm getting the same message in multi in so it's almost what you're saying if i'm hearing this right is you have to bake in your brand into everything you do bake in your experience into everything you do not just in a memo consider how important it is that people like you when you are giving them bad news this is something that i think leaders often underestimate let's say that you've gone out of your way either as an employer or a leader in a division You've gone out of your way to demonstrate how much you care about your people so that they believe it yeah. because it's true because you really have demonstrated it now consider that there's there's bad news that you have to tell <clears> them <throat> they are a lot more likely to absorb that bad news in the proper context in the proper frame if if they like you if they yeah. dislike you they assume you are lying they assume this is going to benefit you somehow. You understand. Uh, so in that way, it's just to kind of bring it back to the, to bringing it all together. Your suggestion to me was that the, a, a teenage girl's light is only going out for very, very good reasons. And that very is good. that the environmental, the environment is, she's not going to survive that environment if she behaves a certain way. But then you come along and you reassure her that this is going to happen. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is going to happen. But here's how you can prepare yourself for when it happens. Well, what's beautiful about that is that you're, you're demonstrating the safe space you talked about before. My father is giving, he is equipping me. When I listen to my father, he equips me for reality for the environment I will face. He seems to understand what it's like to be me. He, uh, what, what happens then is you've actually prepared them to listen to you <laughs> at important moments. Mm -hmm. and, and think about a, a boss that cares enough about their people to want to support them so that the signal they get is I'm, I'm safe with this person. And now when, when you have to, get them to do uncomfortable or difficult things, they're going to listen to you. Yeah. What's interesting is what you're saying. I'm having so many good aha moments. I used to say this in a different way, but I think now hearing you say it, I would say it this way is that creativity, innovation, generosity, hard work ethic already exists. So if you're going to hire people, you can find those people one of two ways. Find the ones that had great parents that instilled those so they could be themselves. But the challenge is there aren't that many of them out there. Or create an environment that allows those that even were raised with poor parents that didn't allow that, that you could be the environment in which they shine in. Yeah. 
And that go. to me is, I can't control the parenting. That's God's I, work right there, baby. And yeah. that's, uh, yeah, can, the, the feeling of fulfillment uh, of bringing somebody out of the shadow into the light. Yeah. That's, that's a feeling. You know, uh, just to go back to something I was saying before when it, with respect to brands. Okay, so if, if you have built yourself an environment of trust, eventually as a brand, you're going to have to deliver some bad news. I'll give you an example. Tylenol has this problem, which is some jackass has poisoned a couple of Tylenol in the city of Chicago. And now Tylenol has to yank every single bottle of that stuff from the shelves in order to protect the, the people that are their customers. Now, they didn't have to pull them all. The government said you only have to pull them in this metro area because this is the only place where we're finding the problem. But Tylenol wants to be a brand that you will trust forever. Mm. So they overreact. They have deliberately created an environment where I don't care what the government says. That's not good enough for me. I'm going to mm. take a multi, multi-million dollar hit here. God's watching. So, so, oh, wow. Well done. Yeah. And then the case that I actually was involved in, the Toyota Camry recall, where there was this, seemingly there was this problem with sudden acceleration and unexpected, unintended acceleration. And they, they so overcompensated, but here was the beauty of it. They, they not only recalled the product and they completely fixed it. And they, anybody that owned the Camry, they said, bring it in, no charge, no problem. I'll take care of it. And and they really did take care of it to the point where when they were leaving people and, you know, returning their cars to them, it always came with some little premium, some little thank you for sticking by us. Why it's so important that you behave as a brand, as a, an honest and sincere and authentic brand is when push comes to shove and you have a crisis moment like that, you need people to believe you. And yeah. they did. Yeah. That's, that's the 401k of Toyota for years building a quality product. And telling the truth. Is so um, here's another aha I'm having as I hear you speak. The concept of this convergent validity. So many brands lack convergent validity. Meaning it's written out really well in their values, but the experience isn't there. Yeah, the hiring the process it. isn't there. The firing process isn't there. The None of the, it doesn't converge to have anything. So I wrote down, you got to bake in, bake in your brand. Mm -hmm in all that you do, bake in the values have to be baked in, in everything. And like going, okay, so what a cool question. Are we convergent valid in our branding? Meaning yeah. is- Are you living? Does, yeah, how does, how do we, let's say you gotta fire somebody. Okay, how do you live your values in firing? Yeah, yeah, like, boy, that's, that's a, a tough- question. Really good example. No, that's a great example. The, Values aren't values until they cost you money. Well, there's an emotional cost to having to let somebody go. And quality organizations let people go in such a way that the person that is separated from company would actually go back to that company if they had the opportunity. There are ways to behave like that. That's how quality yeah. people are. There's no higher compliment than your marketing being based on what people say about you mm. when nobody's looking, you know, when you didn't pay them. Yeah. And this is the day and age we live in right now and why it's so important to live your values. And, and even when they cost you money, because people are going to talk about you one way or the other, what are they saying? Yeah. And, and authenticity renders the bulk of those comments being positive. I, you know, this has probably happened to you, Renee, You'll put something into social media and then somebody will say something snarky or they'll say something outright negative. And before you can hit the keyboard, your defenders have already come to your aid. Yeah. And that is the greatest feeling in the world. I, I got a comment on one of my videos and it was kind of snarky and pessimistic. And I don't like to put bad things out into the ether. I want all sure. of my videos to be positive stories about how human beings are actually better than we're being told. Right. And then every once in a while, somebody just can't swallow it. And they say, yeah, that <laughs> wouldn't happen here. Or, well, that's only because they're Italian and they're not Americans. But, okay. And before I could even respond, 
two remarks had already happened. Like, this dude's just trying to put something positive out there, and this is your reaction? Right? <laughs> and I thought, God bless you. Thank you. Because it's a it's 500 times better when they rushed to your aid first. Well, they're only going to do that if you are living, you're valid yeah. in everything you do. And um, yeah. it's not easy. There are times when, you know, you don't want to carve the back of the furniture. Well, I and carve the back of the furniture. Is that, is that going to be a story? I guess that so. Should, that should be one of your stories. It I mean, kind of should be. I, I'm yeah. writing it down. Carve the back of your furniture. Yeah. <laughs> that's just what it. That would be so cool if you. If it, I think that's just great. I I I go back to that. You know, I was going to say. You know, I hope you start getting more and more of those comments because that just mean, it means that you're you're making a bigger and bigger impact. Unfortunately, in today's world, it, it's it's the more hater type comments that you get, the more reach you're getting. Yeah. Way. Although I am noticing that the there's a there's a new breeze blowing. I'll bet you're feeling it too. I wanted to point out something that I said before we got on, and that was my experience with your group, with your group of people that work for you and with you, and then the people that are your customers. They love you. That is amazing to watch. And really, it's really encouraging to me. I, I look at it as a civilian, right? And I'm looking at it and I'm going, wow, he's really doing something right here because they love him. And I mean, I mean that literally they love you. And it's a, such a, it's such a powerful thing, not because you can weaponize it or monetize it, but because it tells you you're doing something right. Mm. And mm. so that's what I'm eager to get from the ether and from the universe is I want to do things in such a way that people feel like they're part of something reassuring. And for every, every defender that goes out and says to the snarky bots and you know, whatnot, you know, I think you're taking this wrong. It's, it's my way of going, Oh yeah, I must be doing something right. Thank you very much for that. That means a lot. Yeah, the hard part. I don't do well with, with compliments, but I'm learning yeah. to just listen. Well, it's too bad because that's. I, well, I'm learning to listen, but I'm also learning to, in a different way, to say I need to listen because if it is the right thing, then that's the sign that I have to keep doing it. Yet still listening to where I make a million mistakes. But I think the the what's interesting. Somebody told me that your the your critics are sometimes your biggest lessons, right? And yeah. Yeah. The the biggest because they're going to tell you stuff that the people around you won't, you know, and and so there's a there's a beauty in listening because there's there so many amazing I call them amazing comments on some of our more viral videos where I mean they tear apart every aspect of my suit coat and the choice of colors and yeah that I look like a big thumb and <laughs> you know, all sorts of amazing things and you know and I and I always ask myself because at first it was like that was really hard and then I started seeing the reality of the the that that's a reflection of their own inner narrative which is fine and i don't know what it is but i i've heard enough stories to know that there's a lot of pain in the world so they must be in pain and so if yeah. that's what they see that's that's, yeah. that's 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 tough but i go i don't need to add to it right I, you know and could i blow them up and yeah but then where's the virtue in that you know it's the choices where the virtue is and so i like so i a lot of them, I started taking a different approach. I go, you know what? You're right. I kind of, I kind of do look like a big thumb, and I need to get back in the gym. Ha ha ha! And just, just letting it go, diffusing it a little bit. And some people would would say certain things, and I'd say, you know, I'm curious as to where that, you know, maybe ask the question back. And but I think that there's something in there where I go, what were they were making fun of my suit that it was wrinkled, and I'm like, and I looked and I looked close, and I'm like, God, it does look a little wrinkled, you know. And I started laughing. I'm like, you know what? You're right. That's a six city tour. And I got lazy on ironing and I go, you know, and then I put asterisks goes and buys a new steamer. And, <laughs> and I was like, it's, you know, it was actually kind of true. It was a little, it was a little, if you look closely now, I didn't have to say that that's all you got out of it, you know, cause you know, you, I could have, yeah. but I was like, you know what, let me, what can I pull from this in, in that sense of trying to you know, find something in there. And I think it's also, that's what I would rather the vibe be than me fighting with them. I think that attitude that you're expressing right there, that is a, that's very, 
Zen master. It, it, huh. it demonstrates a certain mastery. I was listening to, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Bill Burr. We were working on some commercials. Oh, my favorite and, comic on the planet. Yeah, Bill Burr is a, first of all, when you meet him in person, he's four times smarter in person than he is in his brilliant. act. And he's I know that brilliant. you're thinking, well, how is that possible? I mean, because he's tuning up his actions. No, no. When you watch this guy's mind work, we, like I say, we were working on a commercial where we, it was starring Eddie Pepitone, who was one of the stable of comics that he had under an umbrella called All Things Comedy. And Bill was there to sort of, you know, do what he could to contribute to the success of this project. So I'm listening to him brainstorm and talk and manage people. And I was really oh. impressed by oh. what a what a ferocious intellect he was. Now, what I've noticed is that for all of his seeming abrasiveness on stage and this kind of persona of somebody who is impatient and short fused in person, he is gracious and generous yeah. and he can accept. I, I couldn't believe the way that, uh, you know, as you can imagine, Renee, when comedians stand around, it's a lot of sniping, right? Oof. They're all they're They're going after each other. And Burr's, Burr absorbed it. He didn't, he didn't bash it back. He, one of the cleverest things I've ever seen another human being do is he completely took the teeth out of it by absorbing it and going, well, yeah, I guess that's probably true. Do you think, you know, Patrice, you think that's true? Is Al right? Am I this way? And what happens is if you don't accept it as criticism, <laughs> it, it doesn't have any power. Was that Patrice O'Neill? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I didn't meet. I didn't meet him. Comment. I didn't meet him. Uh, uh, that guy was a genius. He's dead. I'm oh, sad to say. So genius. sad. Well, they're all geniuses. They really are. They're all all of them. I agree. Imagine... People tell me, what do I watch for inspiration? I watch comedy. Oh yeah. I think they're the smartest people on the planet, and they're, because they're observant in a way oh. that, the, yeah, the insights are just. You, you know, what's funny is that I this when I was in Turkey just this last week, I wrote down, you know, because you're going to be speaking. Thank you, by the way, if you're listening to this, come see Neil at Amcon. And he's also part of our mastermind group. But so I was real. thinking, I'm like, what if I had Bill Burr on stage? <laughs> and because yeah. he's by far my favorite comic forever. I've seen him live four times. We flew out to Boston just to see him once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he the genius in how he structures stories and how he can dance on a topic and ride a tightrope. And everyone can fall in line and find themselves in that somehow. And you you expressed yeah. that one time, but it's he knows the the emotional intelligence, and he he does talk about not having any, but the intelligence that he has to understand what everybody's thinking. He is brilliant, and I would love to interview him outside of comedy, but in terms of the artistry and the science behind a joke. He's a he's a very enlightened son of a gun. It's like when you listen to a podcast with Mike Tyson, you can scarcely believe how reflective and thoughtful and educated he is. You're like, this is Mike Tyson. What the hell? Burr is like that. He shocks you with how informed yeah. and balanced and, you know, the equanimity which with he d deals with everything. He's just, he's joking all the time about, you know, the fights he and his wife had. But I'm thinking to myself, that woman has gotten way more than she bargained for. I mean, yeah, he's well-to-do and yeah, he's funny, but there is a thoughtful human being under there that is growing oh, yeah. every day. And by the way, I want to do a shout out to Eddie Pepitone, who is an underrated comedian who is freaking funny. I will write that down, Eddie Pepitone. Eddie Pepitone, he does a bit where, you know how when, it, when you heckle a comedian, they all wait with their knives just under their right they're yep. waiting to savage you. Um, <laughs> Just and, somebody, I hope somebody does. <laughs> like Exactly. Like uh, Eddie Izzard destroyed a guy for 20 minutes on stage. And, and I, I saw that. I would never that. go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Eddie Izzard. Oh my, can you imagine? The guy can do yeah. his act in three languages. Yeah. He has gone to Paris and done his act in French. And he does the same in German. Anyway, Pepitone got heckled and did something that is the greatest piece of jujitsu I've ever seen. <laughs> he he says, really? He goes, come on. If you're going to heckle somebody, oh, let me. And he goes down into the audience, sits. He literally tells the person sitting next to the heckler to stand up 
and move. He takes the seat next to the heckler and goes, now, if you're going to heckle somebody, you want it to be personal, observant. You need to go after their soft spots. Let me give you an example. And he goes, hey, Pepitone, why do you dream of red birds at night? And then he goes into this deep self-analysis and critique of all of his own flaws and just digs in. And, and it here's what happens. At the end of this astonishing revelatory thing of all of his own fears and anxieties, at the end of it, this heckler doesn't feel belittled at all. He feels kind of weirdly understood. And yeah. they shake hands, and it is sincere. It's like, holy shit. I the love heckler, that. The heckler emerged happy. How is I this possible that. that he both destroys him and lifts him up at the same time and then returns to the stage to a standing ovation? It's like, are, who does that? Who who thought to do that, to say, you know what? I'm not going to destroy this person. Yeah. I'm going to sit next to him, literally, and yeah. give him a tutorial. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I I will sit and Google hecklers and watch all of them go through that because it's a lot of the work I used to do was in groups that didn't want to be trained and didn't want to be in the room. Manufacturing oh. sites. And that was my first 10, 12 oh, yeah. years. Oof. And I remember, like, because sometimes you'd have a heckler which would yeah. be a little worse is more of a disruptor. Yeah. And there was one time somebody had, you know, without saying the client or whatever it is talking about the leadership. And it was one of those, Ooh, moments. And my initial response was, I go, see folks, I said, exactly what he's doing here is exactly what needs to happen. Somebody speaking their truth. I said, so now let's go back. I want to hear back what you said here, because let's go back and say that again. And, and I stood next to him looking out and I said, do you know it's how hard deft. It is to say That's... that? Now, w is this the right environment? It doesn't matter. I can wish and hope for that, but I'm going to guess this is not the first time he's tried to say this. And now there's another opportunity to do it. And I said, I think that that's probably the, and so now all of a sudden it became this really great lesson of exactly who we need to be. And, and everybody knew it was the wrong place and time to say it. So that was the unspoken thing that I didn't have to say. Like everybody already knew that. And for There's me to so much, say it. So much go greatness going on there. So, but it, but it was the truth, but I think it was the truth though. Like it's well, what I want, you know what I mean? It's, there, I actually wanted, like, I, I, I can't be, okay. So I'm telling people, go speak the truth, except about me. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. I'm, exactly. I'm immune to don't make fun of me. Right. This don't is call convergent out. validity. I'm yeah. demonstrating to you that this yeah. is my brand. I am behaving according to my brand. I am going to try and understand and be empathetic and create a safe space, even for somebody who is really just expressing frustration about other things. It's not really Absolutely. about you. It's about other things. But, but what I so love about the jujitsu of what you did there was there's there's 55 ways you could have handled that and about 53 of them suck and are bad and what you've done instead is embraced embraced like a jujitsu master is going to take the motion already you know the inertia of the motion and just flow with it so you didn't ignore it you didn't confront it you didn't try to dodge it you let it come at you, grab hold of it and keep the energy going in that direction and redirect it. Mm. And, and in such a way that what is that person going to do at that point? They, they, you've given them an opportunity to participate now in a positive way to accept that, okay, maybe this, you know, cause he recognizes too, this isn't the place to be making a remark like that, but now you can help him Pygmalion effect. Now you can help him rise to a level of new expectation that if I am going to say something, it will be acknowledged. Maybe I should be a little more positive. And maybe the leaders need to listen a little earlier so it doesn't come I out. I love in that. Of meetings, you know? I love that. <laughs> Which is, I, the, I think, the real message there. Let's agree that we're going to do this again, part two with Neil, because oh, this was so sure, much fun. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so, cool. Neil, how can people get a hold of you? How can I want to uh, what, follow you on Instagram and TikTok? What are those? And tell us how they can follow you. And because I want everybody here to hear all of your stories. Oh, well, thank you. So, first of all, you can go, you can find me at neilford.com. That's F O A R D. Yeah, it's N E A L F O A R D and dot com. And when you go there, what you'll find is that there's a, a, there's a kind of a thing about a tour that I'm trying to make of the country to meet people that have reached out to me on social media and said, Hey, let's have a coffee. I just love that idea. Love the idea that I'd show up in Santa Fe and have a friend there that I've never met and, you know, just have a beer or a coffee and, and, you know, talk. Okay. So that's one way they can reach me. Neilford.com. So I mean, let's say here, Neil is, is open to, if you're in some weird place, yeah. Reach out to them and maybe a coffee might be, might be able to happen because you, yeah. this is going to be a thing. There's going to be a story yeah. behind this. Exa that's the idea is that I, I, I would love to collect stories on this trip. And so in all likelihood, what I'm going to do is if I can get a, if I can get an automaker to help, help me with the car and, uh, and maybe some of the gas bill, then I'm going to sort of head east from LA and go city to city. When you go to neilford.com, you can get on the mailing list and then I'll, 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 update you on, Hey, listen, I'm going to be in Fort Worth or I'm going to be in Orlando. And if you're nearby, just send me an email and we'll try to work out where we can meet. I've done it, Renee. I've done it a few times and it's, it's freaking terrific. I met a guy in Minneapolis, Salt Lake city, did it in Sheridan, Wyoming. And it, the phenomenon is that you sit down with these people and you feel like you've known them forever. Yeah. It's like you and I, seriously, Renee, we could talk all I think a, a lot, to your credit, a lot of it is just who you are, which is part of your magic. That's a, and I, well, think I appreciate that. that. Yeah. I think people are just swell, actually. And they're, they reach out because they're like, oh, somebody who feels like I feel. So it's not accidental that the conversations would be like that. At first, I used to think, you know what I'll do is I'll roll into a town and we'll get like 50 people together and I'll get up on a stage. And so, No, I don't want to do that. I, I tried that and it was okay, but it's much more fun just to meet people, you know, like at their diner. And uh, I got people in Nashville that are like, Hey, you know, if you come down here, you can stay at my, my bed and breakfast. <laughs> okay. And so, your yeah. Instagram is Neil Ford. N -E -A yeah, I'm a -R -D. beauty. Exactly. It's just at, at Neil Ford, N E A L F O A R D. If you ever see anybody, by the way, if anybody ever uses my name in some kind of messenger app or something, and they're trying to sell you something, that ain't me. Ain't you. Okay. If they're trying to get, get you to invest in crypto, it's not me. And the reason I bring it up is because this is what's happening lately is somebody, some jackass named Neil Ford 62 is responding to all the people that put comments on my TikTok or my Instagram and going, Hey, and by the way, reach out to me for this crypto. Oh my God. Really? This is why we got to get you verified. Yeah, yeah, it's for what, real. It happened to me until I was verified. And then once oh. that happened, it all went away. Oh, good. thank goodness. Well, Neil, my friend, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you, Renee, and for having look, me on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And I, I know that people are going to love you here. And this will be released here probably within the next week. And so right thank you all. Please make sure you follow Neil. If you like this, comment, subscribe, share it, do all the stuff. If you didn't like it, don't tell anybody as we always say. But please share this with uh, as many people as you can and take as many lessons as you can. Again, we have AmpCon coming up 2023 in Dallas, Texas on October 26th. Neil will be there as one of the main speakers as well as some other really cool people. Wait till I tell you about Jefferson Fisher. Look him up. He's uh, one of the fastest growing accounts on social media right now. And I'm talking about 100,000 new, 100, new followers a day this guy's getting. And he Holy is, mackerel. yeah, he is, I'm talking about every single video he puts out there is gold. He's a trial attorney teaching people how to better communicate and negotiate. And he does it from his car holding his phone up and it's impeccable. Every one of them is solid. Oh, I'm jealous. So he's going to be there. Yeah. So please let us know how we can help keep us informed of what, what you like and what we can do and stay tuned. We'll be coming at you with a lot more podcasts. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you 
for sharing this time with us. If the experience resonated with you, follow us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or AmplifyMyLife.com. Share it with anyone else who's ready to amplify their lives. And remember to let our hearts speak in sequence. For more from Renee Rodriguez, visit meetrene.com.